On an ordinary day in 1991, a young man known by the initials JS went on a hike with four of his friends on the wooded outskirts of their small town. Everything seemed perfectly normal until JS began to feel a strange sense of familiarity, like he had been in this spot before. He couldn't shake this weird feeling, but thought nothing more of it. Little did he know that this was a sign of deadly things to come. Several hours after first experiencing that sense of deja vu, JS was found by the side of the road, covered in cuts and scratches, with his friends nowhere to be found. This is the story of SCP-939, an unforgettable monster that you'll never remember. There was no way for JS to know that the unsettling feeling he felt and the horrors that followed it were the result of an experiment conducted by the SCP Foundation, an experiment with deadly, unforeseen consequences. JS and his friends were exposed to a substance known only as AMNC-227 as part of a series of tests performed by the SCP Foundation intended to determine the effectiveness of this substance as a deliberate amnestic. Dealing with as many mysterious, secret creatures and objects as they do, the SCP Foundation has long needed a way to tamper with the memories of those exposed to the Foundation's various prisoners and test subjects. And when the Foundation discovered AMNC-227, it seemed like it might be perfect for this purpose. So where did AMNC-227 come from? Over a year before the incident with JS and his friends, the SCP Foundation captured SCP-939. SCP-939 is a species of endothermic predators that live and hunt in packs. They are designated Keter class and regarded as highly dangerous and hostile to human life. Native to caves, they have no eyes, translucent red skin, and stand at an average of 2.2 meters tall with an average weight of 250 kilograms. They have four limbs, each ending in three fingered claws and a fourth opposable digit resembling a thumb. In addition to their sharp claws, their mouths are filled with red fang-like teeth that reach up to six centimeters in length. In place of their absent eyes, they have light-sensitive spots running along their backs, which are covered in spines believed to detect changes in air pressure and flow. In addition to their many other terrifying attributes, the internal anatomy of SCP-939 poses a biological mystery. These creatures have no circulatory hmm. system and no digestive tract. That's right, in spite of being predators seemingly acting on a need to feed, they have no stomach. Instead, when they eat, their food builds up in their respiratory system until its presence inhibits function, and then it is regurgitated. In spite of being a creature that should not, under any logical conditions, be able to live, SCP-939 continues to persist and is even capable of giving birth to live young after a gestation period of 12 months. The SCP Foundation was able to study a litter of these young that were born in captivity in September of 1992 though the creatures remain just as much of a scientific mystery as they were upon first discovery. Everything about them seems to defy the logic of the natural world, which, to be fair, is really nothing new for the Foundation. The respiratory system of SCP-939 was found to exhale small traces of an airborne amnestic substance, given the name AMNC-227. This compound blocks the formation of memories for the duration of exposure to it, plus a 30-minute period following the exposure, give or take a few minutes. It is colorless, odorless, tasteless, and completely undetectable in the bloodstream after only 60 minutes. AMNC-227 was approved for use as a Class C amnestic by the SCP Foundation in 1990, following some initial tests. However, after one particular incident involving a young man and his friends, the official use of AMNC-227 was suspended. JS and three of his four friends were previously given a dose of AMNC-227, though the details of why they were given the amnestic has since been stricken from the record. Several months after being exposed to AMNC-227, JS and his friends went out on their ill-fated hiking trip. While hiking, JS was suddenly overcome with a sense of deja vu. When he mentioned it to his friends, three of them agreed that they had felt it too. One of the group, another young man who had not been exposed to AMNC-227, was uncomfortable and decided to go home. JS and the remaining three members of the group made the choice to stay in the woods and try to determine what was triggering the unusual feeling of familiarity. As they got closer and closer to a large cave near the hiking trail, the sense of having been there before grew stronger and stronger. Armed with only one flashlight and a foolish curiosity, the four went inside the cave. They made their way deeper and deeper and deeper into the darkness, 
Not knowing why they felt this way or what they might find inside, none of the group could explain just what felt so familiar. Only that the further they made their way into the cave, the more pronounced the feeling became. It was getting late, and they knew they should have been afraid to venture so deep into a cave with only one light source and no knowledge of what lay inside. But still, they pressed on. One of the group remarked that they should turn back, but the others refused to listen. They wanted to know what they were getting close to, what was drawing them deeper and deeper into the cave. Unfortunately for them, they would get their answer. In the heart of the cave was a pack of SCP-939, waiting patiently for their prey to wander into their domain. There are no witnesses to account for what exactly happened to JS and his companions, but we can reasonably piece the events together from what happened after. Once the friends reached the heart of the cave, the creatures were on them in seconds, raking them with their sharp claws and biting with their fangs. SCP-939 are larger and stronger than most people, so it was probably not much of a fight. However, while his friends were being devoured, JS was somehow able to scramble out of the cave and make his way into the woods in search of help. Under the influence of the AMC-227 that had built up in the cave from the presence of the pack of SCP-939, JS lost a large portion of his memory of the event. He found himself on the side of the highway late at night, seriously injured and his clothes ripped. An officer found him there and asked him to stay still and remain calm until an ambulance could arrive. JS was still in a panic and attempted to run away from the officer, begging to be released so that he could get away. He babbled incoherently about the color red, screaming over and over again about the red, though when prompted, he could not explain what the red he was screaming about referred to. His friends were not with him. Just as the officer managed to calm JS, the ambulance arrived. Its flashing red lights sent him into another frenzy, and he attempted to escape custody, claiming that the red lights were going to get him. The official police report described JS as perhaps being under the influence of a powerful hallucinogen, that he was just having a bad trip, but the SCP Foundation knew better. The Foundation conducted an interview with JS about his experience and determined that SCP-939 was certainly involved. As part of their cover-up effort, they strongly implicated JS in the disappearance and the death of his friends. He was convicted of manslaughter, though the bodies of his friends were never found. It is rumored that the SCP Foundation hired him on a prison work release program, and that he now works as a member of the janitorial staff at one of the Foundation's facilities. This incident led to the suspension of the use of AMN C-227, as it revealed some vital and disturbing information about the compound's side effects. After the exposure to AMN C-227, a person who found themselves exposed to it again would experience a sense of familiarity and felt compelled to investigate the source of this feeling. Essentially, anyone treated with AMN C-227 are not made aware of the existence and danger of SCP-939 would become a perfect victim primed to be attracted to dens of SCP-939. It is likely that this side effect is not a coincidence, but rather a deliberate hunting tactic designed to attract prey that had somehow managed to escape. With no memory of their attack at the hands of SCP-939, this previous intended prey would find mm -hmm. themselves drawn to the same den or even a new one, not knowing that they were walking back into near-certain death. While the SCP Foundation suspended mm -hmm. the use of AMNC-227 as a Class C amnestic, they did recruit a team of SCP field operatives to take advantage of this side effect. This team of operatives were deliberately administered a dose of AMNC-227 and briefed on its effects, as well as the dangers of following the feeling of deja vu should it surface in the field. These infected officers were essentially used as bloodhounds, relying on any sense of unusual familiarity to sniff out new dens of SCP-939 so they could be captured and contained by the Foundation. As far as we know, this operation is still ongoing today. However, now that the Foundation has a sufficient number of specimens to study, additional dens of SCP-939 that are discovered are ordered to be immediately destroyed. As for the SCP-939 still in captivity, they are contained in environmentally regulated and negatively pressured cells with walls of reinforced concrete. The doors to the cells are airtight to prevent the leakage of any AMN C-227, and any personnel that interact with one of the creatures is required to wear level C hazmat gear to avoid exposure and follow decontamination procedures upon exiting the cell. All SCP-939 have subdermal tracking devices implanted to find them in the event of escape. Only one SCP-939 has given birth in the time that the creatures have been in captivity. Strangely, SCP-939 young look indistinguishable from human infants and change their physical appearance at some yet unknown point as they age. 
If any more offspring are produced, they will immediately be separated from the parent and studied. All that we know is that they are found in caves in the woods outside of a small town. It could be any town, even yours. So, if you're ever out hiking and struck with a sudden feeling of deja vu, don't investigate. Don't get curious. Just go home. It might just save your life. The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies, all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. An SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange secretive ritual that the Foundation performs, presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements. After all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3 and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian edged knife, a silver aspergillum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water, that have been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one-kiloton nuclear device, 
which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure. In other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure. The staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the Foundation. Knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member with a Level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of Disposable Class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard, along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant, and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. Solar noon, chickens, and holy water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered, each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully. The guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the Aspergillum and Aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all of this was for. It seemed so ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo jumbo, even while working for the Foundation, but he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet, was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Arikshian mystics imprisoned it, the devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, 
It would have also explained the need for a one kiloton nuclear device as part of this staged ritual. Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council. Emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose, and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day the Devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through their work done and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it, or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, we can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed, at least for a little while longer. SCP-173 it's one of the most iconic anomalies ever contained by the SCP Foundation. This next snapping Site-19 celebrity is known and feared by everyone who works at the Foundation since being contained in 1993. Its nubby concrete hands metaphorically and quite literally stained with the blood of countless people. But this mostly immobile oddity wasn't always a resident of Site-19, and the story of how exactly it ended up there, and more importantly why, is far more ridiculous, insane, and downright terrifying than you could ever imagine. So buckle up, SCP fans, this is the dramatic tale of how this homicidal piece of modern art ended up at the SCP Foundation's largest containment site. To give you an idea of just how weird this origin story is, we're gonna have to leap forward to the year of 2045. We know what you're thinking. Isn't this a prequel? How can it take place in the future? Sit tight, folks. It'll all make sense in the end. Site 91 is where we lay our scene, under the watchful eyes of Site Director Dr. James Long, a senior researcher with level 4 security clearance, the second highest at the Foundation. Dr. Long had given decades of devotion and his expertise to the Foundation. He was a proud man who wore his life of service to the containment cause as a badge of honor. After years of dodging death while researching some of the most dangerous anomalies that Site-91 had to offer, he had ascended to the rank of Site Director which represented the culmination of his life's work, and in his new position of power, he'd only proved himself further 
running a tight ship, and reducing the number of containment breaches across the board. Nobody could say that Dr. Long wasn't extremely talented at his job, which is why he was so confused when he received an email from Alexandra Nala, an administrative assistant working directly for the O5 Council. It was the type of email that no site director ever wanted to receive. Dr. Long was being told that, with no input or oversight from him, the majority of Site-91's anomalies were going to be taken to an undisclosed location for safer containment. The list contained nearly every meaningful detainee contained on the site, including, of course, SCP-173. This particular anomaly had been contained at the site for 37 years after being delivered there in 2008. Dr. Long had devised a perfect method to minimize containment breaches in that time, creating a sprinkler system within the chamber that washes away the waste products produced by 173, reducing the need for risky human contact. But that didn't matter. Despite Dr. Long's loyalty and efficacy in serving the SCP Foundation, the decision had already been made, with no chance of reversing it. According to Nala, the motion to remove most of Site-91's anomalies had received unanimous approval from the O5 Council, and the operations for the transfer would be commandeered by the Department of Extra Universal Affairs, headed by senior agent Sven Kish. Dr. Long was both upset and confused. He was producing some of the best results across the entire Foundation, so why were they taking away all of his anomalies? Did someone on the O5 Council have it out for him? Dr. Long replied to Nala asking if, considering how severe the relocation operation was going to be, whether he could get more information on where the anomalies were being moved to, and why. He felt that, at the very least, he was owed some answers on this. Nala and her superiors didn't feel quite the same way. She replied that Dr. Long sadly didn't have the clearance to know any of the operation's particulars. This information was reserved for those with Level 5 clearance and members of the multi-universal department. All that Dr. Long needed to do was stay out of the way, and everything would be taken care of for him. But that wasn't enough for Dr. Long. He needed to know more. He needed to understand why this seemingly random decision had been made. Realizing that Nala and the O5 Council were a dead end as far as information was concerned, he instead reached out to the next best thing, Senior Agent Sven Kish, the member of the Department of Extra Universal Affairs who was spearheading the relocation mission. Dr. Long implored the agent to give him extra information on where all the Site-91 anomalies were being moved, and why they were being moved in the first place. Predictably, he was once again stonewalled, being told that any information regarding the project was above his level of clearance. In a move that seemed decidedly spiteful, Agent Kish signed off by saying that he looked forward to seeing Dr. Long at Site-91. And not long after that, he did. Agent Kish, along with a huge number of agents and task force members from the Multi-U department arrived on site, bearing state-of-the-art containment equipment. An exasperated Dr. Long wasn't able to glean any more information from this experience. The Multi-U agents were ruthlessly efficient, transferring the lion's share of the anomalies into temporary containment and transporting them off-site within a few hours. By the time they were done, Dr. Long and his staff were left with one of the most desolate and empty containment sites on the Foundation's books. Here was Dr. Long, with decades of service and climbing the organizational ladder, only to be left as a glorified babysitter for a handful of low-priority anomalous items. It all felt like a cruel joke. After several days of nothing happening in the now incredibly uneventful Site-91, a bored Dr. Long reached out to a friend of his, researcher Nurul Shafike Binte Ahmad Ibrahim, whom he called by the nickname Shaq, to vent his frustrations. She commiserated, sharing her sympathy for his suddenly much less exciting working conditions, but saying that at least the job should be a little less lethal now. Shaq didn't know it yet, but on this particular point, she was terribly wrong. Dr. Long shared his theory that perhaps some sites were being consolidated so the Foundation could save money, and that this would lead to layoffs. Shaq essentially told him that he was worrying too much. The reality was that Dr. Long had some very good reasons to be worried. His problem was that he hadn't been worrying about the right things. In Foundation Containment Area 179, something awful was brewing. 
As usual, guards posted around SCP-2317, an old door containing a portal to another world, waited while Foundation staff and D-classes performed the standard Procedure 220 Calabasas ritual within. They were dealing with one of the most dangerous anomalies in the entire universe, but even then, after decades of service, one can be numb to such things. Suddenly, without warning, the door opened and a terrified Foundation researcher tumbled out, panting heavily, eyes bulging in existential horror. He screamed the words that he long hoped would never be spoken in his or even his children's lifetime. It happened. The chains have broken. The Devourer is free. The siren sounded, and an alert spread across the entire Foundation database. SCP-2317 is compromised. SCP-2317-K. The Devourer of Worlds is free. If the creature escapes Area 179, an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario is basically assured, so all efforts will be taken to make sure that the creature does not escape at any cost, and they really did mean any cost. The old wooden door of SCP-2317 splintered as an immense scaly hand sprang forth and caught a wave of devastation throughout the containment chamber. Guards were dispatched in the hundreds with heavy weaponry to buy some time, firing at the Devourer. A beast the size of a mountain rose from the ground, staring at the terrified humans below with its one gigantic red eye. It couldn't even feel the bullets, explosives, or incendiary and laser weaponry being used on it. The monster just shrugged it off and murdered nearly all of its attackers with one swipe of its claw. In a final desperate act, hoping to kill or at least slow down the beast, staff at Area 179 made the ultimate sacrifice and detonated the entire on-site nuclear arsenal. The explosion disintegrated the entire facility in an instant and unleashed a radioactive shockwave that carried destruction for miles. But it wasn't enough. SCP-2317-K walked out of the mushroom cloud without a scratch on it ready to show the human world what real destruction meant. At this point, the battle was already effectively lost, but the Foundation refused to go down without a fight. They dispatched all available mobile task forces, including Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown, a heavily armed battalion strength task force created to combat the biggest and most extensive threats imaginable. And it wasn't even just the Foundation. True existential threats have a way of uniting people, as the GOC and even the Chaos Insurgency temporarily put aside their differences to take the fight to the Devourer. But would any of it be enough? Barrages of cruise missiles and ICBMs did nothing to halt the Devourer's assault, as it rampaged destroying towns and cities at first, then regions, then whole nations. Swarms of scrambled jets and helicopters were knocked out of the sky with casual swipes. The creature bulldozed over landscapes teeming with tanks and heavy artillery vehicles. It snapped aircraft carriers in half as it waded from ocean to ocean, systematically destroying everything in its path. Even satellite-mounted orbital cannons and the heavy energy weapons of MTF Tau-5, also known as Samsara, did nothing to phase the Devourer. It was finally coming to fruition. The dreaded XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, and none of the Foundation's expertise, advanced technology, or limitless resources could do anything to stop it. They aided in evacuation efforts, getting as many people as they could out of harm's way as the Devourer rampaged and destroyed, but even that was doing little more than borrowing time. Eventually, the Devourer would destroy all of them. There would be nothing left. And all Dr. James Long could do was watch helplessly from an almost empty Site-91, waiting for the tide of destruction to reach him. Of course, other Foundation employees, most prominently Senior Agent Sven Kish and the Multi-U Department, had other concerns. All they needed to do was archive data for extraction. Extraction to where, you ask, seeing as the world seems to be at its end here? Well, Universe 7392 Epsilon Blue Lima, otherwise known as our universe, circa 1993. The Foundation works across the multiverse, and an XK-class end of the world scenario in one universe really isn't necessarily a problem in others. On orders of the O5 Council, Agent Kish and his men are charged with extracting data and valuable anomalies like SCP-173 from doomed universes. O5 knew that Dr. Long's universe, Universe 5643 Gamma Orange Delta, was due for an apocalyptic visit from the Devourer of Worlds any day now. That's why the multi-U team went in to extract everything worth saving. Dr. Long and the millions of other level 4 and below employees of that universe's foundation were never told of their impending doom. After all, 
That sort of thing could probably lead to unnecessary stress, and what they don't know won't hurt them, until, of course, it does. In 1993, these anomalous doomed universe SCPs were divided amongst our universe's various applicable containment sites. SCP-173, as you already know, ended up in Site-19, but sadly for the people working there, all the actual data files on this entry's file were lost in translation, so as far as they knew, 173 was little more than a big weird statue with apparently dangerous properties. Upon first placing it in its containment chamber in Site-19 Euclid Wing, Foundation legend Dr. Bright, unaware of just what he had here, assigned Dr. William Moto to begin research on the entity. He recommended that the researcher bring two D-classes for testing. When Dr. Moto was faced with the anomalous entity's blank file, he gave a sigh and began to write something in its description box. Move to Site-19, 1993. Origin is, as of yet, unknown. Wasn't that a delightful little tale? Now we know how SCP-173 made its way into Site-19, and what our own universe may have to look forward to in 2045. So remember, if you ever see Agent Sven Kish planning a transfer of anomalies out of your site, maybe consider using some of that PTO, and maybe consider putting a down payment on a nice, cozy apocalypse bunker over in Iceland. Jay and Michael were a pair of urban exploration YouTubers looking for their big break. You might remember their video exploring the dead mall on the outskirts of your town, or the supposedly haunted 1950s insane asylum out in the sticks, but you certainly won't find these videos anywhere online. After the incident at SCP-823, all of their content was scrubbed away from even the most comprehensive internet archives. Why? you ask, because these unfortunate urban explorers decided that their big break would be exploring a certain abandoned theme park, and it would be one of the last decisions they ever made. Michael and Jay had heard rumors about the theme park. Its name was lost to time, as was the date of its opening and closing, and the reason it was even abandoned in the first place. Even some of the most hardcore urban explorers didn't dare to tread there. Something about it, a good friend had once told Jay, just didn't feel right. Sometimes if you dare to venture into the forest near the theme park at night, you can still hear music. The jolly, piping tunes of rides and carnival stands still beckoning. As if to say, we're still here, come and play. Of course, none of this frightened Jay and Michael. They could already smell the sponsorships from headlamp and compact camera companies. No amount of anxiety would stop them from making their doomed trip to the so-called Carnival of Horrors. It's a terrible shame. If they'd listened to the stories of this place about how unnatural and evil it could be, they might still be alive today. Like all the best urban explorers, they arrived at the woods near the abandoned theme park in the dead of night. They ignored the signs warning them about everything from structural instability to dangerous wild animals to asbestos. Nothing would keep them out. Nothing. They reached the abandoned theme park not long after, though it was a mere shell of its former self. During the several decades of abandonment, nature had reclaimed it. The ferris wheel was covered in overgrown ivy, and the carnival stands were blanketed with mold. As the duo swept through the grounds with their flashlights and cameras, they saw a faded sign that bore the words, Thriller Chiller, the park's most popular roller coaster. They also took their time to marvel at the exceptionally creepy-looking Tunnel of Love, the broken down house of mirrors, and a huge grinning statue of the park's former mascot, Happy Hippo. This theme park was something out of a nightmare, which naturally made it potential video gold. But as the excited duo wandered further into the park, they couldn't help but notice the quiet, tinny carnival music. Music that seemed to be drawing them closer. Michael asked Jay if he could hear the strange, impossible music, and felt a chill creep in when he answered that he did. Could all of the stories be true? They were lost in thought, but their legs kept moving. They were getting closer to something now. They could feel a presence. And was that music getting louder? An instant later, though, another sound cut through the silence. Bang! Bang! It echoed out through the still night air. Birds flew from their perches in the trees. Jay and Michael both fell to the ground, dead their heads taken off by the 50 caliber rounds of a highly trained mobile task force sniper on the payroll of the SCP Foundation. Their recording equipment, along with their bodies, were taken and destroyed. Any trace of them were scrubbed from the internet. 
It may seem a little harsh, but a bullet to the head is much kinder fate than what would have awaited these two if they'd kept walking. That's because the Carnival of Horrors is no dark fairy tale. The rumors are all true, and something really is waiting in the dark. That's why this abandoned theme park is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-823, a Euclid-class anomaly with a violent history. What's even more unnerving is that the researchers studying 823 have repeatedly implored the O5 Council to increase the park's classification to Ketir and allocate more resources for containment, only to be denied. But after you've heard about the horrors that unfolded there and the danger it poses, you'll probably take the researchers' side. The park is divided into two zones, the yellow zone and the red zone. There are to be at least six members of Foundation personnel present in the Yellow Zone at all times to ensure that no civilians wander in. Our two urban explorers earn themselves a death sentence not just by wandering into the Yellow Zone, but passing dangerously close to the Red Zone. This is the true epicenter of the park's dangerous, anomalous activity. It's a place so hazardous that anyone entering, whether they're a civilian or a member of Foundation staff, is to be executed at a distance by sniper fire without hesitation. Once upon a time, though nobody knows exactly when, there was a theme park that seemed no different to any other. Eager children and thrill-seeking teens arrived by the busload, ready to stuff their faces with cotton candy and corn dogs, and then reverse the process on a vast array of roller coasters. But even then, during these good times, there was something dark lurking behind the cheerful facade. Little by little, everyone, visitors and employees alike, started falling victim to strange and horrific accidents around the park. Of course, when it comes to theme parks, accidents come with the territory, but none like this. Here are just a handful of the horrific and mysterious deaths that occurred while the park was open. So strap in, because just like a roller coaster, this isn't for the faint of heart. A pair of young lovebirds decided they wanted to enjoy the romance of the Tunnel of Love. The two sat in a swan-shaped boat as they were ferried through darkened passageways. Anyone would assume that they were having a great time, but at some point, terrible shrieks of pain and fear began to echo through the ride. Attendants, confused and terrified, stopped the ride and found that the screaming persisted. Just some stupid teens playing a prank, they figured and started the ride again. But when the swan-shaped boat finally exited the Tunnel of Love, the park employees were greeted to a horrifying sight. The two teens dead, their bodies somehow fused together at multiple points. Another unlucky customer met a gruesome fate inside the House of Mirrors. They entered, but while inside, they were stalked by a mysterious, carnivorous humanoid entity known as Subject 79. The customer was pursued and eventually caught by Subject 79 and brutally dismembered. Some parts of the body were fused to the House of Mirrors interior, while others, like the right arm, were never found. The customer actually survived their ordeal, and whether that's a happy ending is up to you. But it wasn't just the customers at the park who were in danger. A 23-year-old park employee working a summer job collapsed while entertaining children dressed as the park's cheerful mascot, Happy Hippo. It wasn't uncommon for people to get overheated and collapse in the heavy suits on hot days. But one thing was different here. He was screaming, crying, and trying desperately to remove his mask. People rushed to help, but nobody could get the suit off, and he was declared dead soon after. When he was eventually cut out of the suit, coroners found that the employee had choked to death. His mouth, trachea, and lungs were filled with a fibrous substance later determined to be identical to the stuffing of his costume. An intense roller coaster known as the Thriller Chiller was a magnet for horrific accidents, which became more violent and intense over time. The first accident seemed like a typical theme park tragedy. A safety harness failed, dropping a rider 15 feet during an inverted loop. They landed on the track below, breaking their neck and skull, causing instant death. While this was a tragedy, it wasn't exactly anomalous. But the next major accident on the ride was an entirely different story. This time, 15 people met with disaster while riding the Thriller Chiller roller coaster. Starting from the front and moving back one car at a time, each group of riders was decapitated by blunt force trauma. A new pair of decapitations appeared to happen at every turn and loop on the ride. Forensic scientists still have no idea how this could have possibly occurred. 
Despite all of these disasters, the park was only finally abandoned after a day known as Bloody Sunday, when the anomalous powers of the location reached a 20-year peak. It's believed that 231 people were killed during the carnage of that day, and another seven were horribly maimed. The SCP Foundation contained the Carnival of Horrors not long after, but the mysterious deaths didn't even end there. Foundation Mobile Task Force Row 71, also known as the Origami Toads, were sent in to assess containment procedures and discover the source of all the anomalous deaths. They were unsuccessful, though, and instead they merely added to the list in exceptionally horrifying ways. One agent was found dead, surrounded by empty grenades and bullet casings. It appeared he'd removed the explosive propellant from all of his ballistics and consumed it, dying in the process. Another was found with his jaw broken, having apparently pulled out and inhaled his own teeth, and dying of the resulting internal damage. The commander got the worst fate of all, so horrifying in fact, that we can't tell you the full details. All you need to know is that something was shoved into his brain that really didn't belong there. The Foundation considered having the entire park destroyed with a massive airstrike, courtesy of the Mobile Task Force New 7, aka Hammerdown. However, the O5 Council denied this request, on the basis that the park was too close to populated land. They'd have no plausible cover story for the bombing, and they don't even really know if blowing up the park would prevent anomalous activity from occurring. The Carnival of Horrors is here to stay, folks. The Foundation just hopes to keep it from getting new visitors. So then back to why the researchers want this place upgraded to Ketir. After all, these classifications aren't about how dangerous an anomaly is. They're about how difficult and complicated they are to contain. But here's the problem. According to the researchers, the Red Zone, where the dangerous anomalous activity is at its peak, isn't bound to one fixed position. It's changed position at least three times already, and even worse, it appears to be growing. Not seemingly so Euclid class now, is it? After all, you might not even need to visit the Carnival of Horrors to be in grave danger. If it keeps growing, then someday soon, the Carnival of Horrors may be visiting you. SCP Foundation agents stationed at Area 37 had intercepted chatter from a normally closed communication system in a nearby city. To anyone else, the calls that the Foundation were eavesdropping would seem innocent, even boring. But the Foundation immediately recognized the coded language being used. They were listening to communications between underground cells of the Serpent's Hand, a dangerous paramilitary organization that stands in opposition to everything the Foundation is trying to do. Once deciphered, the Serpent's Hand messages revealed plans for killing Foundation personnel, breaking into containment sites, and releasing anomalous creatures and objects into the world. Pretty standard stuff for the Foundation's least favorite anomaly-loving insurgents, but they kept using one code that even the Foundation didn't have any intel on. They kept asking about the condition of the sisters. Fate has a funny way of sneaking up on you, though, and in time, they would know more about the powerful, sadistic, reality-warping beings known as the Sisters than they could have possibly imagined. But what they would eventually learn was not the kind of data that anyone would ever want to have. After intercepting clear lines of communication from a local Serpent's Hand cell, triangulating the location of their compound was child's play, and mobile task forces were dispatched from Area 37 with orders to neutralize the potential threat before they could mount an attack on a facility. Just when the Serpent's Hands least expected it, they had heavily armed Foundation soldiers kicking down their doors, crashing through windows and rappelling down from the ceiling. As expected, the Serpent's Hand put up a fight, but thanks to their superior training and the element of surprise, the Foundation's mobile task forces came out on top. They were able to capture 15 members of the group for interrogation, as well as a collection of anomalous objects being stored by the group. Among them were a small wooden loom, an enamel needle, and a glass eye. When the task force obtained these seemingly mundane items, a haunted-looking serpent's hand began laughing wildly. He kept repeating, You have no idea what you're getting yourselves into. Nobody knew just how right this man was. Not yet, anyway. Congratulating themselves on a job well done, 
The mobile task forces hauled their captives and the new anomalous items back to Area 37, a heavily isolated Foundation site that specializes in the early containment of anomalous objects for initial observation and study. The objects hadn't displayed any anomalous properties in transit. Maybe the serpent's hand was lying, and these weren't dangerous items at all. Or it was actually just a pile of junk. Either way, they were sent to a Foundation researcher on site to conduct preliminary tests. The loom, the needle, and the glass eye were laid out across the table for observation, when suddenly, the attending researcher felt a dark presence looming behind him. He turned, with sweat beating on his brow, and saw three humanoid translucent figures floating in the air behind him. They would soon become known as SCP-1765-1, 2, and 3. The researcher could feel the power emanating from these silhouettes. Reality seemed to bend and shimmer around them, the way heat distorts the air into a mirage. He could tell right away that they were powerful reality warpers. Even in their brief time communicating with the researcher, 1, 2, and 3 displayed both intelligence and unique personalities. 1 was clearly the ringleader, displaying an articulate command of language. 2 displayed a more mischievous side speaking with a cockney accent, and had a tendency towards creepy giggling. Three was the least communicative of them all, preferring to speak in short, simple sentences, often consisting of just single words. Though, of course, actions speak far louder than words, and it didn't take long for the sisters to define themselves with their actions. One told the scared and confused researcher that they'd been observing the SCP Foundation for quite some time, and that they deeply admired the Foundation's adherence to the scientific method. Of course, the researcher wasn't so much flattered by the sisters' statement as they were afraid for their life. They tried to call security for backup, but found that their tongue was withering and turning into a shriveled, blackened husk in their mouth. The sisters didn't like to be interrupted. As the tongueless researchers slowly collapsed in front of them, the sisters explained the purpose of their visit. They wished to assist the Foundation in their quest for knowledge, and as such, they would conduct a number of experiments on their behalf. They would then happily share the resulting data with the Foundation to compare notes. One expressed optimism, saying that she believed they were about to embark on a beautiful scientific relationship. The reality couldn't be further from the truth. The sisters began their work moving rapidly around the facility, bending and twisting reality wherever they went. They circled Area 37, making it separate from the rest of the world it inhabited. Area 37 no longer belonged to planet Earth. It belonged to the sisters. It was their private experimentation lab, filled with live and unwilling guinea pigs. The Foundation attempted to retake the facility by force, sending in Mobile Task Force IOTA-6, also known as the Canvas Cats, into the belly of the beast but they never returned. In addition to changing the fabric of reality itself, they also altered the physical structure of Area 37 to better serve their experimental designs. It was divided into four sections, marked A, B, C, and D, each with their own unique purpose. Section A, which had formerly been Area 37's storekeeping, mess hall, and dormitories, had been the least affected by the sisters' attacks on reality. The biggest alterations were the appearance of two large metal vats situated in the east corner of the mess hall, a monitoring station connected to the other sections of Area 37 that replaced the storekeeping zones, and an imposing marble sign hanging above the dormitories that reads, Control Group, a quick refresher from science class. The control group in an experiment is the group that isn't subjected to the experimental effects the others are, so they can be used as a benchmark to measure against. The same was true here. The prisoners in the control group were the safest of all, but they were forced to do something almost as bad. They had to watch the horrors playing across the rest of the facility. One of the sisters would occasionally return to this section to oversee the feeding of the control subjects, and to encourage them to take part in the observation of their unlucky peers. Section B, which had formerly been Area 37's outer grounds and sports facilities, had been transformed into the center of a localized spatial temporal abnormality. In layman's terms, this meant that its size, climate, atmospheric conditions, pressure, and temporal flow were all subject to constant changes based on the whims of Sister Number One, who oversaw all the experiments performed in Section B. For those unfortunate enough to be trapped in Sector B, SCP-17651 was their god. 
but she didn't subject them to her whims randomly. No. In her own words, the purpose of Section B was to delve into the effects of repetitive action performed under unusual conditions on the human psyche. For example, one experiment was set up to test the physical and mental fortitude of a researcher, a field agent, and a sanitation worker. The trio were confined in a sports center and ordered to measure the length of every single pipe and the angle at which each connected to others with nothing more than a wrench, a ruler, a brown paper pad, and a ballpoint pen. The task was an arduous one, taking over 10 hours. And as soon as the subjects were done, one restructured the sports center and ordered them to perform the task again. The same happened another 459 times before one finally concluded the experiment, leaving the subjects with broken bodies and minds in the aftermath. Section C, which had previously been the facility's main office block, exhibited a similar level of anomalous activity to Section B, except that it was the domain of the more sadistic and mischievous Sister Number 2. Her main area of scientific interest was studying group dynamics and interpersonal relationships during extreme conditions. Very extreme conditions. For one experiment, the office block had been transformed into a kind of football stadium, with the goalposts removed and replaced by concrete bunkers. The two teams were the captured Serpent Hand members and the members of MTF IOTA 6, fresh off their attempt to retake the site. The two groups were forced into a deadly game with incomprehensible rules, including rising platforms and hooded figures throwing fiery projectiles into the crowd, trying to incinerate the players. But victory didn't lead to safety, as the winners of the game were crushed to death with giant metal hammers, just for the fun of it. Two didn't even try to pretend that this act had a valid scientific justification. Section D, which had once been the facility's high-risk containment area, was now the strangest and most mysterious section of all. Under the charge of the equally peculiar and enigmatic Sister No. 3, this area appeared physically unchanged from its state prior to the arrival of the Sisters. Temporally, however, Section D was the most warped of them all. It existed in a kind of temporal bubble, outside of the rest of our reality's timeline, giving Three a frightening amount of control over all that went on in her domain outside of time. There, she was performing the most strange and incomprehensible experiment of all. The subject was the former site director at Area 37. He was brought to a table and asked to choose between two different flavors of ice cream that were presented to him. Sounds simple enough. So then why is this the worst of all? Because the site director is caught in a time loop. He's been choosing between various flavors of ice cream for over 10,000 hours, and he doesn't even seem to know. Three's only comment on the matter? Delicious. All attempts to liberate the unfortunate inhabitants of Area 37 have failed miserably. The sisters don't appear to operate on any form of logic or empathy, and thus cannot be reasoned with. With talks having failed and Mobile Task Force IOTA 6's attempt to retake the site ending in disaster, the only solution left was to create a guarded perimeter around the area, using technology like the Scranton Reality Anchor to fight back against any potential escape by the sisters. The sisters are potentially so dangerous that if they ever truly set their minds to leaving, it's considered acceptable to detonate the facility's on-site nuclear warhead in hopes of finally putting a stop to them. In the meantime, the Foundation has built giant external servers for processing the vast quantities of research data the sisters are constantly sending from their horrifying experiments. Sadly for the inhabitants of Area 37, their grim fate continues to this day. The experiments never stop and the subjects of said experiments seem to be condemned to the eternal torment of SCP-1765. In a way, their unwilling sacrifice protects us all, because if ever the sisters were interested in performing experiments on a larger sample size, well, all we can do is hope we end up in the control group. It's a perfect day for a wedding. On a warm spring afternoon, a bride and a handsome groom are exchanging the special rings they had custom designed and made for each other. As they take turns placing the rings on each other's fingers, a man standing at the end of the wedding party steps out of position. He approaches the groomsman next to him and reaches into his jacket, taking out a pair of pliers that he hands to the groomsman. The groomsman happily takes the tool and then, without any hesitation, shoves the pliers into his mouth and begins removing his teeth one by one. When he is finished, he hands the bloody teeth to the man along with the pliers. 
The man then goes to the next groomsman, who repeats the same process. He continues going down the line until all of the groomsmen and bridesmaids have removed their teeth, seemingly without pain or resistance. The man then approaches the bride and groom. He hands each of them half of the pile of teeth, which they gladly accept. They then begin to eat the teeth without delay, seemingly not bothered by the intense damage they're causing to their own teeth and jaws by doing so. The man watches as the groom moves the priest who was officiating the wedding aside. As the entire church looks on in joy, the groom opens his mouth and the deafening sound of cicadas are heard. This is only the beginning of what the SCP Foundation has labeled an SCP-2852 event, a terrifying and little understood phenomenon that is better known by the nickname of the anomalous creature responsible for them, Cousin Johnny. The Foundation had been trying to contain Cousin Johnny for decades, not that it had ever done them any good. Johnny is a Keter-class anomaly that's thus far proven impossible to contain. This is an entity so dangerous and volatile that three different mobile task forces are devoted to detecting and disrupting its activities. MTF Upsilon 36, aka the Party Crashers, MTF Upsilon 52, aka Cater Duty, and MTF Upsilon 99, aka the Altar Boys. But so far, all the Foundation has been able to really do is swoop in afterwards and do their best to pick up the pieces of people's shattered lives. Cousin Johnny has so far been observed to only operate in the North American subcontinent and only seems to appear at Anglican or Catholic baptisms, weddings, and funerals. However, Foundation operatives charged with keeping a lid on Cousin Johnny harbor the hidden fear that he may one day expand his hunting grounds and wreak terror worldwide. If Johnny became multinational or multi-denominational, his violence, insanity, and pure evil may truly become impossible to minimize. So compatible communities are constantly monitored for increased levels of juvenile delinquency, sterility, domestic violence, and divorce. After all this, you're probably wondering, who or what actually is Cousin Johnny, and how does he cause so much horrific tragedy? At face value, nothing about the appearance of Cousin Johnny would suggest an anomalous nature, or even any sort of danger. He appears to be a middle-aged white male, often with scruffy hair and a beard. On a cellular level too, Cousin Johnny appears all too human, but when you look at his physiology, it's a whole different story. Cousin Johnny has no identifiable organs whatsoever. His body is made out of a fibrous muscular tissue. The only exceptions are his teeth and hair, which are made out of a kind of chitin, a key component of insect exoskeletons, such as those possessed by cicadas. Johnny's eyes are the first clue that something is off about him. From a distance, they appear perfectly normal, but up close, they're glassy and dead. This is because his eyes aren't actually attached to any nerves inside his head. With no nervous system or vocal cords, Johnny's ability to see, move, and talk defy any kind of logical explanation. His speech will seem completely normal to the people under his spell, but to anyone else, it comes out as complete nonsense, often described as word salad. If people in attendance are briefed in advance about this phenomenon, whatever hypnotic ability causes them to hear his sounds as intelligible words won't work and they'll be aware of how nonsensical it all sounds. But of course, that doesn't mean they're safe. Cousin Johnny appears at family gatherings and religious rituals, and immediately he'll be treated as though he's always been there. You know your Cousin Johnny, right? You go way back. Or at least you're pretty sure you do. Nothing will appear unnatural about his sudden presence. In fact, if you're one of the victims of one of his incidents, Chances are you'll actually find yourself taking a shine to Cousin Johnny. Sure, his sense of humor is a little crude and raunchy, but you can't help but enjoy his company. He's a fun guy to be around, and after all, he's family. As previously mentioned, he'll only appear at three different kinds of events, baptisms, weddings, and funerals, and only those that are affiliated with either the Catholic or Anglican religions. The SCP Foundation has classified baptisms that Cousin Johnny attends as blue-level events. Weddings are known as white-level events, and funerals are black-level events, with each one escalating in severity, violence, and horror. First, baptisms, the blue-level events. In these events, Cousin Johnny will appear and begin to act as a third godparent, despite there traditionally only being two. As the infant is lowered into the holy water, the entirety of their top layer of skin will come off like a molting snake. Despite looking horrific, 
This apparently causes no harm to the child. The godparents will then eat this discarded skin as though it's the most normal thing in the world. After this, the family will leave the church together, and Cousin Johnny will leave with them. He won't appear at any subsequent celebrations of the child's baptism. Of course, this is just the beginning of the terror. Following Cousin Johnny's appearance at the baptism, the child's risk of dying in the next six months skyrockets, and if they survive, they're at an increased risk of becoming unstable and violent later on in life. Their parents and godparents will both become unable to conceive any further children and are likely to be found dead from drowning within five years of the event. Those who are only tangentially involved in the baptism ritual have a massively increased chance of failed pregnancies, or if they do conceive, they may become a danger to their offspring. Children who live through blue level events and survive past adolescence will experience adverse side effects when encountering the songs of cicadas well into adulthood, from experiencing physical sickness to going through dangerous psychotic episodes. Weddings or white level events are more complex and severe. In this case, Cousin Johnny will insert himself into the wedding as a groomsman, and the most horrifying events will begin to take place after the vows have been exchanged. Johnny will provide various implements that allow the bridesmaids and groomsmen to remove their teeth, which are then given to the bride and groom to eat, which they do, causing severe damage to their own teeth in the process. The groom will then vocalize an unknown cicada call at an incredible volume, as loud as 140 decibels in some instances rendering the bride and everyone else near the altar completely deaf. At the wedding reception, where everyone is continuing to behave as if nothing out of the ordinary is happening, Cousin Johnny will ruin things farther by giving the best man's speech. The speech is more of his typical complete nonsense, though if you're there you'll never realize this and think that this is the best speech you've ever heard with some in the audience laughing hysterically while others cry uncontrollably. Once his speech is done, he'll present a gift to the newly married couple, 3.5 kilograms of human hair in various colors, 13 deceased specimens of a certain cicada known as Linnae's cicada, and 23 human teeth in a cardboard box. DNA tests on all the gifts have been inconclusive as to their origin. Much like many celebrity marriages, unions that occurred during white-level events never last and all end up divorced within two years, often as a result of domestic violence, and any children born during their brief marriage will be violent and unstable. But it's not just the wedding party that gets to experience the fun of a visit from Cousin Johnny. All married individuals who attended the wedding will find that they are unable to conceive children, despite no biological indicators of infertility. Any children present at the White Level event will show no interest in romance throughout their life, and often die tragically before reaching the age of 18. Finally, and most horrifying of all, are funerals, or black-level events. While blue and white-level events can potentially be disrupted before they are completed, lessening or preventing the horrific results, there is as yet no way to stop or prevent a black-level event at any stage. Any attempts to prevent Cousin Johnny from entering the church or funeral home will lead him to simply manifesting inside. Once in the room where the funeral is taking place, Cousin Johnny will first take up the role of eulogizer and begin speaking his standard nonsense to the attendants. The person who was emotionally closest to the departed will then open the casket, if this was not already an open casket funeral, and will then produce a large knife. It's unknown where the knives come from, as they're not present before the event and they disappear after. The funeral attendees will then use the knife on their wrists and sometimes throats, draining their blood into the coffin. Many lose more than enough blood to result in death, but none ever die from this, nor do they seem to feel any pain from their wounds. As the attendees take turns bleeding into the coffin, Cousin Johnny continues his eulogy which eventually evolves into a cicada song, the kind sung by Linnae's cicada males. The attendants sing the same song back to him in a kind of call and response. Cousin Johnny will then approach the coffin and vomit in a mixture of blood, wood pulp, and dead cicadas. The funeral will then proceed as normal, and the blood, vomit, and cicada-filled casket is then taken to the cemetery and buried. Black-level events will usually end with the body being interred in the ground, but if there's a wake after the funeral, the horrors of the black-level event will continue. At the wake, Cousin Johnny will climb on top of a table, lie down, and encourage the other attendants to devour him, which they do. All the while, he continues to talk his nonsense, until there is nothing left.
Much like blue and white level events, being in attendance leads to horrific after effects. All participants who experience this event will separate from their family through either suicide, moving, or divorce. Every individual present at the event will also find that they are no longer able to produce offspring, and couples' presence may also fall victim to incidences of domestic violence, often involving cannibalism, that usually leave one or both participants dead. While 6 out of 10 children involved will attempt to murder one or both of their parents before they turn 18. These black level events are so horrible for all involved that any members of the specialized Cousin Johnny mobile task forces that happen to witness such an event are treated with Class A amnestics before they are transferred to another task force or retire to ensure that they don't have to live with the memories of what they saw. Prior to that, they are closely monitored for any strange or antisocial behavior to make sure they weren't affected by the event. And they aren't the only SCP Foundation staff at risk of having been impacted by Cousin Johnny. It is theorized that as many as a third of Catholic and Anglican D-Class personnel were involved in the Black Level event at some point, and were driven to madness and violence by their fateful brushes with the strange relative that no one knows. So next time you're at a baptism, or a wedding, or a funeral, stay vigilant, keep an eye on the other guests, and always ask yourself, do you really have a Cousin Johnny? You hear their footsteps coming down the halls, or are those your own? Can you even tell the difference? You can tell they're getting closer and you can feel the hate, the rage. You turn, shaking, and finally see them standing right in front of you. But in that moment, you might as well be looking into a mirror. And who knows? Perhaps you are. You just don't seem to remember having so many reflections. Have you ever heard the saying, you are your own worst enemy? Of course, it isn't usually meant literally. But what if it was? What if you had to fight a monster that was you? All of your flaws are reflected back at you. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your deepest fears with no way to escape except a battle to the death. Either way, you're not making it out alive. It's just a matter of which version of you survives. But this isn't a thought experiment. No, according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, it's very much a reality. There is a place where this nightmare comes to life, and it's known as SCP-1919. SCP-1919 is a hotel and converted mansion built in the early 20th century. From the outside, it looks pretty much like it did when it was first built and it almost looks like a comfortable place to stay, if you ignore the eastern side of the building that has sunk partially into the ground. The inside, however, is a different story, where it's clear the ravages of time have taken their toll. The floorboards and ceilings are rotting, collapsing in on themselves, and the rooms are filled with debris. It's deadly enough to explore the hotel for these reasons alone, but this is only the beginning of the danger for a person inside. In order to determine just how dangerous it is for either one person or group to enter the structure, the SCP Foundation planned a series of research expeditions into the abandoned building, led by Foundation scientist Dr. Lemkowitz. The first expedition seemed relatively normal, at least it did at the start. A 39-year-old Caucasian D-Class male, known as D-7, was sent into the structure with a camera and a communication system, guided remotely by Dr. Linkowitz, or Dr. L, and another operative, a former head of the MTF Tau-11 Youth Hostiles, who is referred to in this file only as T-11. When he arrived at the building, D-7 was unable to get inside through the front door or windows. After several minutes of trial and error, he was finally able to get in through the western entrance. Dr. L picked up a strange, high-pitched whistling noise upon D-7's entrance into the building, but it quickly faded away and was disregarded by T-11. D-7 discovered a torn painting, a portrait of a young woman with red hair. Next to the portrait, shallow scratches could be seen in the wall, the floor, and parts of the ceiling. Suddenly, D-7 ducked into a hiding place alarmed. He and the other two operatives listening to his audio feed could hear heavy breathing, and it didn't belong to D7. Dr. L recommended that D7 evacuate the building at this sign of another entity inside, but T11 overruled, ordering him to disregard that instruction and continue his investigation. D7 was told to stay at a safe distance from whatever was inside with him, and attempt to capture it on video. 
D7 turned off his flashlight in order to better hide, but T11 commanded that he turn it back on. Whatever was caught in the beam of light was difficult for the camera to see, but it threw D7 into a panic, and he began to run in the opposite direction. When prompted to explain what he saw, D7 simply said, it was me. D7 ran through the dark, panting with fear and exertion. Unable to see where his feet were landing, he tripped over something and came crashing onto the ground, dropping the video camera. This allowed the observing officers to finally see what D7 was so frightened by, and it became clear just why D7 was so terrified. A man, identical looking to D7, approached from the end of the hallway, making its way towards the real D7. It was followed by another man who also resembled D7 and another, all running toward the original. They all looked exactly like him, with a few notable differences. They were dressed in the same uniform, with the same build and the same features, but each had something slightly off about him. One was missing eyelids, another had malformed hands, and the third had its lips fused together into a fleshy mass beneath its nose. Dr. L moved to cut the camera feed, but T11 demanded that it be kept running. D7 couldn't be seen by the camera, but the microphone picked up the sounds of flesh and cloth being torn, along with pained, panic screams as the duplicates set upon him. After a moment, the screaming stopped. Two hours later, the camera was broken, and the expedition brought to a troubling end. This was the Foundation's first glimpse at the creatures inside of SCP-1919, and it was not pretty. It did, however, allow them to begin understanding the nature of the building and what happens when a person goes inside. It appears that when a human enters the hotel, several humanoid creatures manifest throughout the building. These creatures look like the subject and are equipped with the same clothing or items that the subject brought inside with them. Though they are nearly mirror images of the subject, they are always slightly warped in a variety of ways. These have included changes to limb and digit length, joint mobility, sealed nostrils, lengthened jaws hanging loose and limp, missing eyelids, and lips that are fused together. These creatures are highly aggressive towards the structure of the building itself, as well as to the subject that they resemble. They do not, however, attack each other. They appear to operate with a hive mind, exhibiting swarm intelligence like that of an ant colony. Once they have been spawned by the entrance of a new person, they will not stop until said person either escapes the building or is killed. After the unfortunate end to the expedition, the Foundation prepped for a second trip inside. This time, three men were sent in with Dr. L's guidance, known as D3, D4, and D9. Video cameras were sewn into their clothes to leave their hands free and help avoid some of the issues that came up during the first expedition. This small team was sent in with the orders to terminate the remaining copies of D7 and further examine the hotel's interior. Upon opening the door to the building, they were immediately attacked by one of D7's copies, which D9 was able to quickly dispatch by firing his weapon at its head. Next, after a great deal of reluctance, the three men entered the building where they spotted something unusual inside. Dr. L was horrified when the camera feed revealed 17 discarded video cameras spread across the floor. They didn't have much time to react to this new discovery, however, because two doubles, one mirroring D7 and another mirroring D9, emerged from the wall and began to attack. Dr. L ordered the team to take shelter then called the team of guards outside of the hotel's perimeter. They were ordered to begin an immediate full perimeter lockdown, preventing the doubles from leaving the hotel. D3, D4, and D9 attempted to make their way to a safe corner of the building, but found themselves met with a murderous double at every turn. At this point, Dr. L began to hear an unusual sound over the microphone feed, a high-pitched whine like that of a dentist drill. The operatives on the ground couldn't hear a thing, but on Dr. L's end, it was deafening. As the team proceeded deeper into the hotel, they became overcome with a strange feeling of foreboding. Dr. L ordered them to turn on their flashlights, but they refused and begged Dr. L to keep quiet. When prompted to explain, D9 said, She can hear you. The operatives stopped responding, but their camera feeds caught a faint glowing white light coming from beneath a door. The door opened, and the light flooded the camera, making the images it captured hard to decipher. Just a few frames of a quick-moving female silhouette were captured before the cameras cut to static. The bodies of D3, D4, and D9 were never recovered, nor were their cameras. 
A third expedition was also sent into SCP-1919, but very little is known about what occurred during it. The video transcript is highly classified, and only those present for its events or proved to research SCP-1919 have access to it. An update to the SCP-1919 file following Expedition 3, though, indicates that new information was revealed about the hotel during the excursion. According to the file update, there is some kind of being at the center of the location, which is causing all of the other creatures, the doubles, to appear. The only information available about this being is the use of the word her in the official foundation log about SCP-1919. This seems to match up with the last moments of the operatives in Expedition 2, when they told Dr. L that she can hear you and the few frames of a female figure that were captured by their cameras. Nothing else is known that has been made available to anyone outside a very select few. Only the original report exists, and all other copies of it have been destroyed. The Foundation has undertaken special containment procedures to make sure that none of the entities from inside the hotel escape, whether they are the evil twins spawned by humans entering the building, or the mysterious female being at the center of the entire disturbing phenomenon. The Foundation has classified SCP-1919 as Euclid, and a two-kilometer radius must be maintained around SCP-1919, with all roads leading to the building are blocked or diverted so that no vehicles are able to reach it. This perimeter is guarded by a set of at least 40 armed and armored guards at any given time, as it has been determined that the doubles spawned by 1919 are equipped with whatever the human they are copying has. No one is allowed to enter the hotel with body armor or weapons of any kind. Anyone that approaches the perimeter that is not a part of an official expedition team will be immediately terminated. No new expedition teams are allowed to enter the building unless all doubles from the previous expedition have been exterminated. In the event that they cannot be exterminated, enough time must elapse between expeditions that the previous doubles have starved to death. Though they do not seem to feel hunger, the doubles do need to eat to survive, and will die when left alone for long enough. SCP-1919 has been sealed off from the rest of the world so that no hapless civilians can wander inside and find themselves torn to pieces by warped images of themselves. But that comfort turns cold when you realize that the SCP Foundation still does not understand what causes these doubles to spawn. Is it scientific, supernatural, or something else? No one can be certain. Even more inexplicable is the entity at the center of all of this. An unknown female presence capable of wrecking frightening amounts of violence by turning victims' own images against them. What is the purpose of these funhouse mirror nightmares? Who is she? What is she? And what does she want? Currently, the doubles have shown no interest in leaving the hotel except to attack intruders. And thanks to that fact, as well as the reinforced perimeter outside, these copycats have not appeared outside of the building itself. But what happens if they do escape? or if the entity that controls them decides to make her home elsewhere. There is no telling what could happen if this dark power is allowed to move beyond its current containment. Are you prepared to fight a vision of yourself, twisted almost beyond recognition, lunging after you with wide bulbous eyes, unnaturally long arms, and a distended jaw hanging down below its neck? Better hope you never have to find out. In high school, the days tend to blend together after a while. Math test, unrequited love, annoying group project, stress, rinse, repeat. Sometimes a big football game or a school dance or maybe a fight in the hallway breaks up the monotony a bit, but it's normally pretty uneventful. That's always fine by me. I've never tried to be a popular kid or the center of attention. I prefer to keep my head down, work stage crew for the school plays, and just hang out with the same small group of friends I've known since we were little kids. It was on one of those ordinary days, in a long line of similarly ordinary days, that something came to destroy the peaceful high school existence I'd gotten used to. As I sat in history class passing notes with my best friend Zach and ignoring a video about the Civil War, I had no idea that I was about to live through the worst day of my life, and I would be one of the lucky ones. I'd survive. The others... Let's just say they wouldn't be so lucky. I was just scribbling a response to Zach, something about hanging out and playing Xbox after school, when the PA system crackled to life. Our principal's voice cut through the droning narration about the Battle of Antietam as he spoke. Staff, this is a lockdown. Initiate your lockdown procedures immediately. 
If you're a visitor outside the building, please leave the property immediately and call 911. I assumed it was just another lockdown drill, until I saw my teacher's face. She looked pale, her expression tight, like she was trying to hold it together for our benefit. I could see her hand shaking as she reached to turn off the video. When I heard the tremor in her voice, I knew for sure she was terrified. This was not a drill. As our teacher locked the door and we all climbed under our desk to crouch in the dark and wait out the lockdown, I could hear my classmates whispering fervishly. Everyone was trying to figure out what was going on. Someone suggested a kid had brought a knife to school. Someone wondered aloud if a threat had been called into the principal's office. Zach cracked a dumb joke about a mutated frog escaping from the biology lab when suddenly a scream rang out echoing down the hall. Have you ever felt an entire room of people holding their breath at once? I have. We listened for the sound of fighting, for gunshots, anything, nothing. And then, another scream. Louder, closer, and longer than the last. It was the scream of pure, unadulterated fear and pain that dissolved into a wet gurgle that made my stomach turn. Zach and I shared a look, one that said, whatever's going on, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. I could feel my chest tightening and it was getting harder to breathe. I tucked my head between my knees, holding on to the back of my head, and trying to take in deep gulps of air. The room felt as if it tilted on its side and I thought I might pass out, when another sound brought me back to earth. It was coming from the back wall of the classroom, by the chalkboard. The sound of liquid sloshing onto the floor mixed with plaster splintering apart and pieces clattering all over. I tried to get a better look, but the room was dark and I didn't want to leave the relative safety of my desk. If there was someone, or something coming into the room, I didn't want it to see me. Zack had a better angle than me. I could see him craning his neck to get a better look when he clasped a hand over his mouth in shock. I heard him scream muffled against his hand. What had he seen? What was it? Before I could even ask, my teacher's cry rippled through the darkness and the silence. Get out! Get out! She repeated over and over again, and I could hear the raw desperation in her voice. It was like someone ushering passengers off of the sinking Titanic. Someone who knows there is no hope for them, but hopes they can at least save the children before it all goes down. Run! For the love of God, just run! Her voice broke, from fear, from pain, or both, and the sound was enough to get my legs working again. My classmates had the same response, and we blindly rushed for the door, flipping over desks and knocking chairs to the side as we scrambled for an exit. Zack grabbed my arm and I held on tight, afraid I would lose him in the chaos. Someone unlocked the door and we poured into the hall. Just as I made it out of the door, I couldn't help but turn back and look. Call it morbid curiosity, call it instinct, call it stupidity, but I had to see what happened. I turned just in time to see a nightmare brought to life. The wall was melting, covered in something thick, black, and putrid. The smell invaded my nostrils and I gagged on it. Her wretched gray arm had its fingers wrapped around the teacher's wrist, skin peeling off to reveal muscle and bone. It looked like it belonged to a corpse, but it gripped her with inhuman strength. She was pulling with all her might, but I watched helplessly as the arm pulled her into the melted wall like she weighed nothing, swallowing her body and her screams with it. And then, she was gone. Zack tugged on my arm hard, yanking me into the hall. Come on, man, run! He hadn't seen what I'd seen, or he would have realized that running might not be enough. Whatever this thing was, it didn't play by any rules I knew. Running was all we had right now, though, so we ran. I looked around for a weapon, something, anything I could use to defend myself, but I couldn't see anything that would help. Instead, all I saw was the destruction the intruder had left in its wake. All around me, the halls I walked through every day were falling to pieces. They weren't just damaged, they were coming apart at the seams. Lockers were warped beyond recognition, walls completely dissolved, sections of the floor reduced to sizzling puddles of goo, and everywhere, everything was covered in that same black slime. It smelled worse than you could ever imagine. It smelled like the complete loss of hope, like the point of no return. It smelled like death. We reached the end of the hall when I heard something shifting behind us. I suddenly became aware that we were alone. The sound of frantic footsteps, hushed whispers, doors slamming shut and locking, had all quieted. Where was everyone? I glanced over my shoulder and saw one lone figure shambling down the hall towards us. It was far away and I could scarcely make it out in the darkness, but I could hear dripping, sizzling, and the smell of decay growing stronger. That was not a classmate or a teacher. Whatever it was, it was taking people away or killing them. I didn't know exactly what. But of whatever it was doing to everyone, Zack and I were next on its list. The scariest part was how slowly it moved. Maybe its legs were too rotten to move any faster, joints disintegrating into useless mush, but it seemed more deliberate than that. To me, in my panic-clouded mind, it seemed that it was just taking its time. It didn't 
need to rush. It knew that when it wanted to catch its prey, it would. I couldn't suppress the sick feeling in my stomach this time. I keeled over and vomited onto the floor. When I looked up, Zack was beckoning me from just inside the doors to the auditorium. Come on! In here! He could have left me behind for the intruder to take, tried to save himself and sacrifice the slow friend frozen in place with terror, but here he was looking out for me again. Even in this horrible situation, I felt a surge of gratitude. I booked it across the floor, forgetting for a moment about the shuffling corpse making its way towards us, and joined my best friend in the auditorium. It was eerie in the dark, the curtains soaking up and dampening sounds, barely any light illuminating the normally cheerful props and backdrops left from a recent production of Alice in Wonderland. A once friendly place felt twisted, like a mockery of Wonderland with a monster stalking outside and waiting to pounce. We sat on the stage, listening to the sound of our labored breathing. The air felt heavy, but I welcomed the smell of paint and dust over the nauseating stench that permeated the rest of the school. <sighs> Are we the only ones left? Zack whispered, breaking the silence. He was the first one to say what we were both thinking, what we both feared. N no, I said with false confidence. I, I think some of them got out before. I couldn't finish the sentence. Somebody had to get out. It, it can't just be us. I leaned my head against a giant paper mache toadstool. Glad it was too dark for Zack to see the tears filling my eyes. What was that thing? He asked. Did you see it? I sat up straighter. I thought I was the only one who gotten a look at the thing, however fleeting. No, but I, I heard it and smelled it. He coughed. It took me a while to answer his question. Eventually, I found the word. It's evil. We sat in silence for a long while after that. I don't know exactly how long. Moments like that where at any second you could be lost forever. Time stretches out into something unrecognizable. I was starting to think foolishly that we might be in the clear when I heard a strange sound. It was a creaking, like footsteps on an old wooden floor. I looked around for the source of the noise, but I couldn't see anything. It sounded close, impossibly close. Creak, creak, one step, then another. Where was that coming from? There was no wood floor in the hall, nothing above us. By the time I understood, it was too late. The top of a head, slimy, clammy, and gray, with tufts of limp white hair clinging to the soft flesh, began to emerge from the stage where we sat. Eyes hollow and dead, but somehow alert and searching for us came next, followed by a gaping wound where a nose should be, and a wide, toothless grin. It looked almost like a person, but it was wrong. Just wrong. Every cell in my body rejected it, screaming at me with thousands of years of animal instinct that I had to run. I grabbed Zack's arm and yanked, but he didn't come with me. I turned to look and my heart jumped into my throat. It had him. Its bony fingers, I had a hold on his legs, and he was already halfway gone, pulled into the slick black puddle in the stage. His face was damp with tears as the reality of his fate set in. He grabbed my hand in his and squeezed. Run! Was all he could get out before the old man pulled him out of sight. So I obeyed my best friend's wish. I ran, and I hid in the prop closet, hand over my mouth to stifle my breathing. Suddenly there was a loud bang, and I heard voices yelling, something that sounded like a gunshot, a blast of bright light, and a voice, male and official sounding, called out, Is anyone in here? You can come out! We're with the police! I opened the closet door and peered out to see hazmat suits wielding bizarre weapons and carrying devices I'd never seen before. The man who had spoken approached me, took my hand and asked me if I'd seen anything. I got the strong sense that I should definitely not tell him what I'd seen. Uh, n no sir, I said. He nodded. Whether he believed me or not, he knew I wouldn't say anything more. Gas leak, he said. Destroyed large parts of the building. Highly dangerous. We need to get you out of here. They took me home, and I hugged my parents tighter than I ever had before. That night, the news covered the tragedy at my school. The gas leak had taken dozens of lives before the authorities had gotten there. Everyone else can accept the story all they want. I know the truth. I see it when I close my eyes. Imagine it standing over me when I wake up in the dead of night. Those hollow eyes. That horrible smile. The stench of death and rot. It looked right at me. It saw me. It wanted. I can't let myself think about what it wanted. I don't know exactly what I saw, but I know a few things for certain. There was no gas leak. Zack and the rest of the people it took are gone. And if that monster ever escapes, it's coming after me next. Throwing indestructible lizards into vats of acid. Hunting strange chicken men through forests in Ireland. Arguing in Latin with a man wearing a haunted Roman centurion's helmet. 
When you join the SCP Foundation, you might be expecting high-octane drama all the time. Especially with the name Street Sweepers, you'd expect this mobile task force to be neck-deep in some real action-packed street racing. Maybe you wouldn't think that they'd be tasked with driving all day every day in four-hour shifts tailing a semi-truck all over Birmingham, Alabama. But as Agent Moore and his colleague pulled into the lay-by behind the truck, neither of them were ready for what they were about to witness. SCP-2590 was first discovered by the Foundation at a routine traffic stop. Investigating a totally different anomaly in the Birmingham area, Agents Peters and Smith had been posing as local police officers. The Foundation had been trying to track down an artifact that was supposedly being smuggled across the U.S. in the back of a nondescript station wagon. Peters and Smith had been allocated a pair of beat-up old police cruisers, which they'd parked across the dirt road, fully blocking any traffic from coming through. It was several hours into their shift when the incident occurred, just at the point they were starting to lose focus. Taking a look through the suitcases and memorabilia from a family's trip to Disney World, Peters had taken way too long to hear the noise of the engine swelling behind him. He spun around to see the hulking shape of the semi-truck barreling straight towards him, Agent Smith, and a family of five. With only two seconds to react, he yelled out at the top of his lungs and dived out of the way, leaving the trunk of the car wide open with five screams emerging from inside. Smith, who had been sitting in one of the cruisers, only just managed to get out before the semi made contact. Eyes closed, Agent Peters waited for the inevitable sound of screaming rubber, the bang of metal on metal, and the shower of glass on asphalt, but it never came. When he opened his eyes, the station wagon was still parked up in front of them, the two police cruisers still blocking the road and all of the Disney merch still piled high in the trunk. The semi was driving off along the road, on the other side of their blockade, with not a scratch on it. Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Smith, who had kept his eyes open and witnessed the whole thing, leapt into action. He ordered his partner, still lying confused in the dirt, to administer Class A amnestics to the family and call in for backup. Agent Smith himself jammed his keys into the ignition, twisting them so hard he almost bent the metal, and took off after the vehicle. What Agent Smith and Peters had just witnessed was the very first Foundation exposure to SCP-2590, fondly nicknamed Trailer Trash. As Smith pulled up alongside the vehicle and studied it for the first time, he made a note of its initial appearance over the radio, an appearance which remains unchanged years later. The badges on the vehicle claim that it is an international ProStar day cab semi-trailer truck, complete with an unmarked trailer. As the agent flicked on his lights and indicated that the vehicle should pull over, he noted that it didn't have any license plates on it, either front or rear. He leaned forward in his seat, trying to peer into the cab to make out the driver, but in the Alabama sun, the man just looked like a shadowy figure. They drove side by side along the road for almost a mile, the truck made no signs of pulling over despite Agent Smith's continued insistence and repeated flashes of the cop lights, but it also didn't attempt to pull away either. It just continued to drive a few miles per hour below the speed limit. The driver didn't seem to look across at him once. Having discussed it with Foundation staff, they decided it was best not to draw attention to the situation. They had no idea whether this SCP was hostile or posed any threat to civilian life, but having blue and red lights flashing at it appeared to be doing little to change the situation. Instead, he switched off the sirens and pulled in behind the truck, tailing it around Birmingham as the Foundation readied further agents to respond to the situation. For almost an hour, nothing of note happened. Agent Smith drove behind the trailer, watching it like a hawk. He observed that it obeyed every traffic law to a T. It never broke the speed limit, never cut anyone off, and left room for other vehicles to merge. If it hadn't seen it drive straight through a roadblock as if it wasn't there, he would have never suspected a thing. But then the truck turned its turn signal on. They had just come off the highway and merged onto a quiet side street, just as the sun was starting to hang low in the sky. The truck crept across the side of the road, squeezing its brakes gently, and stopped. Agent Smith matched the action the whole way, pulling up about 20 feet behind the trailer, in constant radio communication, he kicked open his door and stepped out into the evening air. Foundation personnel advised that he keep his hand on his gun at all times and approach with caution. He didn't really need them to tell him that. 
Smith called for the driver to step out of the cab. No response. The truck just sat there with its hazards on, engine off. After a moment, there was a clunk, and the trailer door started to slowly open, all by itself. Agent Smith called in backup, but they were still several minutes out. Instead, he ran back to the car, gun raised, and waited to see what was inside as the door slowly opened to reveal nothing. No, not quite nothing. There was something small on the floor of the trailer, right in the center as if it hadn't been moved around at all by the vehicle's motion. It was red, a kind of elongated cuboid. He reported it all to the Foundation over his radio, then paused when he recognized what it was. A Kit Kat candy bar, or to be more specific, a Kit Kat Chunky. What happened after this point was hazy. Agent Smith was found on the roadside just 20 minutes later, confused about what had happened. The truck was nowhere in sight. However, a security camera from a convenience store just up the street happened to capture the interaction. In the footage, you see Agent Smith approaching the trailer with his gun raised, looking at the Kit Kat. He tries to enter the trailer, but is unable to, so he approaches the driver's side door. While talking to the shadowy figure in the cab, he drops his gun and stands motionless, a confused and sleepy expression on his face, until the trailer door closes and the SCP drives away. Contact was re-established with SCP-2590 soon after, and has been maintained almost uninterrupted ever since. The findings made on that initial encounter seem to hold true across further examination. Personnel have reached out to Navistar International, the company that supposedly manufactures this model of semi-truck, but there appears to be no records of its creation or shipment to the US. In fact, no documentation at all can be attributed to the truck or any components on it. The driver in the front cab is a humanoid figure who is perpetually shrouded in shadow, designated SCP-2590-1. Attempts to reveal the driver's figures have proved ineffective, as even powerful spotlights do not shed enough light into the cab to render the driver visible. Quite what this driver's role is in the operation of SCP-2590 is unknown. SCP-2590-1 appears to have some proximity-based amnestic qualities, as anyone approaching it on foot has reported memory loss and confusion soon after, just like Agent Smith. As also discovered by the two agents and their roadblock, containment of this SCP is simply not possible. While the majority of the time the SCP is corporeal, it possesses the ability to pass through solid objects at will. All attempted roadblocks have resulted in the same thing happening. The SCP will just phase right through on them, as if nothing was there. Since it cannot be contained in the usual way, a different operation has been set up to monitor the truck's activities, which, so far, have proven to be apparently harmless to the civilian population. Mobile Task Force Gamma-133, also known as the Street Sweepers, has been established to follow this SCP around Birmingham at all times. They operate in four-hour shifts, with two agents in unmarked vehicles sticking close behind the trailer at all times. The Foundation was able to fit a tracking device onto it as well, providing researchers with continuous location data for where they can find the vehicle. At seemingly random times, supposedly determined by the SCP itself, it pulls over somewhere quiet and opens the door to its trailer. The door will remain open for 60 seconds and then close again. Any attempts to enter the trailer have been blocked by some kind of invisible barrier, seemingly impenetrable to most approaches. More violent and destructive methods of entry cannot be authorized for testing, due to the heavy civilian population in the surrounding area. Every time the doors open, there is something different in the trailer. Researchers are trying to ascertain some kind of pattern or messaging behind most of the objects, but many seem to be random. The current list of things that have appeared in the back of SCP-2590 include an iPhone 3G, a red apple, and a lit light bulb without any visible form of power supply. Most notable about the objects in the trailer is that often they appear to be human beings, as happened on the night that Agent Moore was on duty in the Street Sweepers. The agents pulled in behind the truck as per usual when it slowed to a stop beside the highway. Agent Moore got out of the vehicle second, unenthused about the monotony of the task he had been assigned. Expecting to see a cardboard box or a chapstick when the trailer door opened, he was left shocked 
when he came face to face with himself. Few people can say they have seen themselves in real life. Most of them have been administered with various anesthetics to make them forget, but Agent Moore went on to report how bizarre of an experience it was. He claimed that it was utterly unlike looking in a mirror where your reflection is flipped and follows your every move. Seeing yourself standing in three dimensions, moving independently and evidently in a great deal of distress is an experience that few would envy. Any time a human being materializes in the trailer, they appear to be in a great deal of distress as they attempt to escape through the invisible barrier. Agent Moore and his partner Agent Hall could do nothing but stand and watch in confusion as the copy of him attempted to free himself before. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the vehicle pulled away again. Several instances have occurred of duplicate humans appearing in the trailer, but each time the original person seems to have had no knowledge of this taking place and nothing out of the ordinary happens to them. However, there appears to be some small pattern demonstrating the SCP as an awareness of the Foundation, as it has also duplicated Agent Inglis's sister, who has no connection to this SCP at all. Incident 16 was the most distressing of all, as a large slab of metal appeared in the back of the trailer, with the SCP Foundation logo painted across it. Agent Inglis and Schultz were on duty at this time, and observed copious amounts of blood flowing out of the metal slab. Before long, the blood filled the back of the trailer, pushing up against the invisible barrier. All of a sudden, 52 seconds into the encounter, the barrier vanished, and a cascade of blood with the slab inside were launched out at the two agents at a speed of over 190 kilometers an hour, killing them both instantly. Since this incident, SCP-2590 has been treated with greater caution. The most mysterious thing to have come from researching this truck came on December 4, 2011, when, for the first time, the truck's tracking beacon stopped working. It had been seen pulling into an abandoned warehouse, and so a team of street sweepers was immediately dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found the vehicle moving through the warehouse at a slow crawl. Choosing to pursue on foot and leave a pair of agents at the entrance, they followed the SCP through the facility until it came to what agents described as a service tunnel or sewer of some sort. Putting headlamps on, they followed the truck down into the tunnel, maintaining radio contact throughout. As they reported the direction they were traveling and the distance, it quickly became apparent to Foundation personnel that this was no ordinary tunnel. The warehouse was positioned overlooking a cliff, and so the geography was not physically possible. As the street sweepers descended further into the tunnel, they noted there was increased levels of carbon monoxide. Radio contacts started to dip in and out, losing signal as they went further downhill. Just at the edge of their signal with the Foundation, the truck stopped and opened its trailer door. Inside was just a single piece of parchment with the words, I'm just delivering a message written on it. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the truck continued. After they had passed the kilometer mark, the radio signal worsened quickly and after a couple of scrambled messages, the team down there were not heard from again. The channel stayed open for another six hours before the Foundation made the decision to announce the agents missing in action. In March 2015, over three years later, a radio signal came into contact with the Foundation again from Birmingham, Alabama. It was from the headset of the squad leader who had gone into the tunnel. Initially confused as to who had gained access to the comms channel, the Foundation demanded that the agent state his full name and rank. The agent, himself confused, obliged, questioning why they were so suspicious. He and his team claimed to have only lost contact for about 15 minutes. They had followed the FCP a little further until carbon monoxide levels had risen too high to continue, at which point they had watched the truck disappearing into the distance as they walked back to the surface. All agents have undergone extensive psychological rehabilitation to settle them back into society, as well as classes to fill them in on things like the London Olympics, the Ice Bucket Challenge, and Gangnam Style. As for SCP-2590, it is back out on the roads, roaming around Birmingham, Alabama continuously, never stopping for fuel, always obeying the rules of the road, occasionally opening its trailer doors to reveal new and bizarre findings. A D-Class drag races through the testing zone, screaming at the top of his lungs and doing donuts. A mime who is also in the testing chamber stares with disapproval, tapping his foot impatiently. Did we mention that the car is made of spiders? 
Yeah, this one is gonna be a weird one, folks. Stay tuned for one of the craziest SCP stories you've ever heard. Emily had always dreamed of taking a trip to Paris. When the opportunity actually came to visit the city, she was overjoyed. She spent her time exploring art museums, tasting the bread and cheese, and walking through the city streets, taking in the sights. One of her favorite things about Paris was all of the street performers. As she walked, nibbling on a pain au chocolat, she delighted in the antics of jugglers, tossing colorful balls into the air. She gasped at the feat of athleticism and grace demonstrated by acrobats and contortionists. She giggled at the absurd shows put on by puppeteers and dabbed tears from her eyes at the sound of beautiful songs played and sung by musicians. It became part of her daily routine. One night, as Emily was walking back to her hostel after a long, languid dinner, she found herself walking down a street she had not encountered before. There was no one around except for her. It was a lovely moment of peace, but it also struck her as a little bit eerie, and she wished for the familiar throngs of people. Up ahead, she spotted the silhouette of another person and let out a sigh of relief. As she got closer, she could make out the black and white striped shirt, the suspenders, the black beret, the white face makeup, rouged cheeks, and red lips. A mime. A real, classic French mime. She couldn't believe her luck. When he spotted Emily approaching, the mime began to start a performance. He began with a classic, the invisible box. He felt around the walls of the invisible box, looking out with exaggerated wide eyes and an open mouth. Emily clapped and reached into her bag for a little bit of money she could use to tip him. After all, he was putting on a performance just for her. He deserved it. She walked closer to the mime, looking for a place to put her tip. She didn't see one, so she held up her hand, offering the money directly to the mime. As he took notice of how close she was getting, the mime began shaking his head vigorously, eyes wide and insistent. She didn't understand that he was trying to warn her until it was too late. Dozens and dozens of spiders began to crawl over the mime's face, out from inside of his clothes, from his shoes pouring out over the street and crawling up onto Emily. She tried to brush them off, she tried to run away, but no matter how hard she tried, the spiders just kept coming. All she could do was scream. In an attempt to experience a little bit of live performance, Emily unwittingly came across SCP-3247. SCP-3247 is a humanoid entity standing at approximately 1.7 meters in height. It wears a striped shirt and suspenders similar to the garb of a stereotypical French mime, as well as what appears to be white makeup on its face and all other exposed skin. Though these aspects of its appearance seem as if they should be removable, the clothing and makeup are, in fact, parts of the entity's physiology and cannot be removed from its body. This is not the only unusual aspect of the entity's physical form. Though it looks corporeal and solid, the entity cannot touch or directly interact with any solid matter, with one particular exception. There is a colony of spiders living on and inside of SCP-3247. These spiders have officially been designated SCP-3247-A and are highly protective of SCP-3247. If anyone or anything attempts to approach SCP-3247 in a threatening manner, the spiders will swarm the potential threat. As any savvy, anomalous activity enthusiast might have already gathered, these are, of course, no ordinary spiders. Not only do they dwell on and in an intangible mime, but they have a peculiar response to witnessing a human being making specific gestures or pantomiming activities. When this occurs, the colony of spiders will form the shape of an object related to the gestures, which they will then hold for up to three hours, or until given additional stimuli that prompt a change in shape. While the spider colony is assembled into shape, they will be able to share some of the given object's functions in spite of being technically nothing more than a mass of well-coordinated arachnids. As for SCP-3247, it is either incapable of speech or unwilling to speak. Instead, it communicates with Foundation staff via silent miming. When it does, the spiders will frequently react to its gestures, becoming effectively living props. SCP-3247 does not seem to be especially thrilled with this, likely because miming is inherently a propless art form, and these spider-based props undermine its artistic vision. 
Otherwise, though, the presence of the spiders does not seem to bother SCP-3247. In order to better understand the nature of SCP-3247-A, Foundation staff conducted a series of tests. In each test, a D-Class was given a gesture to perform in the presence of SCP-3247. Then, the research staff would record the spider colony's response. During the first test, the research staff ordered D-11424 to attempt to get as close to SCP-3247 as possible. They did not, of course, warn him about the spiders. He entered the testing chamber and approached the mime, who was pantomiming the act of climbing stairs. As the mime pretended to ascend an invisible staircase, and D-11424 grew closer, instances of SCP-3247-A emerged to take the shape of a staircase, much to the mime's frustration. SCP-3247 stopped its performance, throwing up its hands in a gesture of defeat. The spiders turned their attention to D-11424 and began to swarm him, treating him as a potential threat. Panicking and unsure how to communicate with SCP-3247 while the spiders were overpowering him, D-11424 began to wave frantically at the mime. The mime simply shrugged, giving him a look that said, Well, what do you want me to do about it? At this point, Control intervened, instructing D-11424 to pantomime some kind of activity. Fortunately, before turning to a life of crime, D-11424 had spent several years in a professional improv troupe and was well acquainted with pantomime. His performing instincts kicked in, and he leapt into action. He put a hand to his ear as if listening to the ringing of a telephone. The spiders stopped their attack, responding immediately to his cue. They formed into the shape of a small table, with an old-fashioned rotary phone on top. The mime rolled its eyes in disdain at the sight of this prop-based performance, but D-11424 was on a roll. He crossed to the phone, picked up the receiver, and held it to his ear. Hello? He asked out of habit. He wasn't expecting to hear a voice on the other line, but then he did. Or rather, he heard the approximation of a human voice, created by a swarm of anomalous spiders. It sounded a bit like a human voice sped up, high-pitched, and squeaky, speaking some sort of gibberish. Realizing that this was his moment to escape, D-11424 placed the phone back in place and promptly left the testing chamber. The spiders remained in the shape of the rotary phone and the table for the next two hours, at which point they disassembled and returned to their home on SCP-3247. After his surprisingly creative work in this first test, it was decided that D-11424 would be the designated test subject for all future testing with SCP-3247, provided that additional complications did not arise. Though he wasn't especially fond of spiders, D-11424 was more than happy to accept the assignment, not that he had much choice in the matter. Still, it was definitely a better deal than getting fed to SCP-682, and it was a nice excuse to use his improv skills again after a long retirement. During the second test, D-11424 knew what to expect from SCP-3247. For this test, he was told to pantomime playing tug-of-war with an invisible opponent and an invisible rope. Now that he knew his improvisational scene partner would be a colony of spiders, he was able to enter the testing chamber with confidence. Once inside, he began to pantomime, pulling on a rope, having that rope tugged away from him by a strong opponent, and struggling to pull back. The spiders reacted right away, arranging themselves into the shapes of a long rope, one side of which was in D-11424's hands, as well as a large humanoid, vaguely muscular in shape, that was holding the other side of the rope. The spiders gave the rope a sharp tug, causing D-11424 to lose his balance and fall over, the rope slipping out of his grasp. Aside from some injury to his pride, he was otherwise unharmed. During test number three, D-11424 was instructed to enter the testing chamber and close his fist, while extending the thumb and index finger in a gesture colloquially known as finger guns. Sure enough, as soon as he assumed this position, the spiders assembled into the shape of a handgun. D-11424 was then instructed to pick up the spider gun and squeeze the place where the trigger would be if it was a real gun and not, you know, spiders. A loud cracking sound was heard when the D-Class squeezed as a spider shot out of the barrel of the gun at high speed before smacking into the nearby wall, leaving a small hole in the surface. D-11424 fired several more times, each shot firing an individual spider at a pace that attending researchers described as faster than a speeding bullet. After firing six rounds of spiders at the wall, 
D-11424 was instructed to place the spider gun back on the ground. During test number 76, D-11424 was ordered to hold his hands together and wiggle four fingers on each hand, effectively pantomiming a spider. The research team was curious to see what the spiders would do when presented with a shape that matched their usual unassembled form. SCP-3247, who generally did not react much to the experiments on its spiders, began shaking its head in mild disappointment as approximately 640 spiders emerged from its body, dividing themselves into groups of eight. Each group of eight spiders then joined to form one large spider, leaving eight spiders. These eight then split into pairs, who joined together into one larger spider, and so on and so forth until there was one single giant spider made from the hundreds of smaller spiders. At this point, D-11424 followed his heart, jumping onto the mega spider's back and riding it like a bull at the rodeo, as the spider bucked and ran back and forth across the room. According to official transcripts, D-11424 yelled, Yee-haw, throughout this part of the test, until the head researcher ordered him to climb down from the spider and exit the room. He was reprimanded for his behavior and warned that if he acted without approval again, he would be taken off the project and reassigned to a much less enjoyable position as one of the designated eyes on SCP-173. D-11424 immediately agreed to comply with future instructions. During test number 133, D-11424 was sent into the testing chamber and told to shadowbox. He danced back and forth across the cell, doing his best Sylvester Stallone impression and throwing punches in the general direction of the spiders. In response, approximately 3,000 spiders poured out of SCP-3247, assembling into the shadowy shape of a boxer, and began to attack D-11424. The mass of spiders conducted itself at the level of a professional boxer, dodging D-11424's hits before coming back at him with a jab, cross, lead uppercut, and rear uppercut before he could defend himself. D-11424 fell to the ground unconscious, and guards were forced to interrupt the test in order to remove him from the room and take him to the infirmary for medical treatment. After taking some time to recuperate, D-11424 returned to testing with SCP-3247-A. He was instructed to mime steering a wheel, such as that of a car. Immediately, a number of spiders previously unseen during testing emerged from SCP-3247, arranging themselves into the shape of a sedan. D-11424 was then commanded to climb inside of the spider car and see if he could start it. He refused, insisting, I'm not getting in a spider car, are you nuts? When pressed by control to comply with orders, he made a rude hand gesture. I'll let you guess what that was. The spiders began to scramble to reassemble themselves in response to the changed gesture, prompting Control to stop the test early to spare the researchers' sensibilities. With strict guidelines to avoid inappropriate or violent gestures, D-11424 was sent back into the testing chamber with instruction to try out a variety of animal-inspired gestures in rapid succession. He formed one hand into a fist and made a peace sign with the other hand, putting them together to make a snail. As he made his hand snail crawl through the air, the spiders crawled onto the floor and assembled into the shape of a snail in front of D-11424. Though the spiders moved quickly, at their usual scuttling pace, once they formed into the snail, they slowed to a gradual creep. D-11424 noted a shiny, slimy trail left behind on the floor as the spider snail moved. He was asked to consider touching it, but refused, simply stating, Ew, no. Next, he took his hands and formed the shape of a wolf's head howling at the moon. The research staff were curious to see if the spiders would form a wolf's head or the animal's entire body. They got their answer as the spiders swarmed and shifted, forming the shape of a full-sized gray wolf. The wolf padded back and forth across the room before sitting down, lifting its head and emitting an audible howl that sounded almost indistinguishable from the real thing. Next, D-11424 crossed his thumbs over each other, fluttering hands like a pair of wings. The spiders separated into smaller groups and came together to form butterflies similar in size to a monarch. These spider butterflies began to flap their wings and, much to D-11424's surprise, they took flight and swirled through the air around him. The D-Class was so moved by the beautiful sight that he shed a single tear, which he promptly wiped away out of embarrassment. Control then prompted him to try the next animal gesture. D-11424 used his hands to form the shape of a rabbit. 
Several of the spiders crawled away, returning to SCP-3247, and the remaining spiders took on the form of a rabbit. The spider rabbit hopped realistically around the room, twitching its ears and tail. At this point, D-11424 was instructed to offer the spider rabbit a carrot. He produced a carrot from his pocket, holding it out in front of him. The spider rabbit hopped over to him and, one crunch at a time, began to eat the carrot until none remained. D-11424 appeared shaken up and asked to leave the testing chamber. As he followed all of his instructions, this request was granted. When he exited the chamber, all he would say was, Where the hell did the carrot go? It doesn't have a stomach, it doesn't have a mouth, where did it go? SCP-3247 is kept in an isolated chamber located in the arachnid wing of Area 12. It does not appear to require food or rest, but it has been provided with a television and a collection of silent films for morale purposes. Instances of SCP-3247-A are fed via a fully automated system that dispenses 20 grams of live crickets every week. Should a containment breach occur, staff have been instructed to find a way to make escaped spiders take on the shape that renders them motionless, then simply pick the spider cluster up and place it back inside of the cell. It is unlikely that the Foundation will ever get an explanation for where the intangible mime and his merry band of spider performers originated from. But one thing is clear, they won't be performing in public again anytime soon. Now check out SCP-058 Heart of Darkness and SCP-2427 A Thing Full of Stuff.